Hi, welcome everyone. My name is John Davis and I'm supervisor of MarineDebris.info produced by Octo. On this webinar, we also have Nick Weiner, Octo's Director of Open Initiatives, who is handling the webinar's technical side. And this webinar is co-hosted by the EBM Tools Network, which is co-coordinated by Octo and NatureServe. So happy you can all be here today. It's going to be a good presentation. We have Ingrid Giskus, Joel Basic, and Joan Drinklin. Ingrid Giskus is the Global Head of World Animal Protection's Ocean Campaign and also the Chair of the Steering Group of the Global Ghost Gear Initiative. She is in Vanuatu right now in a cyclone. <laughs> and we hope that she's able to stay on, on the call throughout. Uh, Joel Basic is the Secretariat of the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, which is hosted by World Animal Protection. And Joan Drinkwin is Associate Partner with Natural Resource Consultants, a private fisheries consulting firm in Seattle, where she works on lost fishing gear issues. Together, Ingrid, Joel, and Joan will be talking about the Global Ghost Gear Initiative and how its three working groups are working to tackle the deadly issue of ghost gear worldwide. The way this will work is that our speakers will present for about 30 or 40 minutes combined, then we'll have the rest of the time for questions. We definitely encourage questions or comments, and you can submit them at any point during the webinar by clicking on the Q&A button on the webinar user interface menu at the bottom of your webinar screen. Also, if you have any technical difficulties, you can note those by clicking on the chat button and we'll do our best to help you. When we get to the question and answer portion, I will moderate the questions, taking one at a time and asking the questions to our presenters. So let's get started. Ingrid, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much for those introductions. Um, hopefully everything should go well from my end being here in Vanuatu. Um, I'm actually here on a project visit uh, this week of which Joan will talk a little bit more in her section of the presentation. So the Global Ghost Gear Initiative um, is a global initiative as the title says, that works to tackle um, ghost gear at a global scale. Next slide please, Joel. So um, as you might have seen recently, there's been a lot of research that has come out about the problem of fishing gear. And the numbers that are on this slide, the 640,000 tons of fishing gear that is lost, abandoned or discarded in our oceans every year is likely to be much, much higher. We've had some reports come through from the ocean cleanup um, that said that in the North Pacific garbage patch, about 46% of surface debris was made out of fishing gear and that close to 70% of all microplastics, so plastics visible by eye, are made out of fishing gear as well. So the problem is likely to be much higher than was initially thought. Um, obviously, because fishing gear is made to capture and kill, it will do so after it's lost in our oceans as well. And that's why it's one of the most harmful and deadliest forms of marine debris for our ocean animals. Uh, it doesn't all, and it does also impact on our fish stocks as well. So it's not only iconic species uh, that it has an impact on, but also on fish stock levels. Next slide, please. So the Global Ghost Gear Initiative was formed in 2015, and it's a collective of NGOs, private sector, fishing industry, academia, and governments who all contributed to tackle this problem at a global scale. We really felt that because the problem brings all these actors together, it's important that we all contribute to that dialogue and uh, work together in a collaborative way on, on facing this issue. Um, and we really focus on the collective impact of our members. We feel that everyone, every one of those stakeholders has a key role to play and we draw on their strengths and their knowledge to tackle the problem globally. So we work across the four R's, reduce, remove, recycle and rescue. And in all of the project work that we do, of which Joan will highlight one particular example, we always try and make sure that those four R's are represented where possible. Sometimes we have three R's, sometimes we have two R's, but we try and work as much as possible in a holistic way um, to make sure that we approach the problem from all angles. Next slide, please. Um, so the Global Ghost Gear Initiative was founded by World Animal Protection in 2015. Um, and our mission is really to ensure safer, cleaner oceans for everyone by driving economically viable and sustainable solutions. So that's why it's really important for us that we work together with seafood companies, with gear manufacturers, with fishers on the ground to make sure that every, any project or solution that we propose will actually work in a practical way for them as well. And to make sure that actually there's uptake of our solutions 
um, globally and that they're not just become niche projects. So we, in our, in our approach, we focus on the health of marine ecosystems. Uh, we focus on protecting marine animals and we also focus on safeguarding human health and livelihoods. So making sure that the industry is part of this, this picture as well. Next slide, please. So the Global Goes Gear initiative is um, a, a grouping, a platform, an initiative. But with any um, initiative or platform, it's always useful to have a bit of structure in it to make sure that you actually can draw on everyone's strengths as much as possible. Um, so I don't want to dwell on this slide too much, but you can see here that we've got a steering group of which Joan and myself are part, and we've got five other members. Um, it's a cross-sectoral steering group. So again, we make sure that everyone's represented in it. Um, we have the Secretariat, which is Joel, um, who supports our work. We have advisory committee, which is made up of experts. And then the bulk of the work is delivered by our three working groups. So we focus on building evidence, on the finding best practice and informing policies, and also on catalyzing replicating solutions. And so the working groups are the one, the drivers of the work, who are each chaired by a chair and also have a coordinator in place. Next slide, please. So just to show um, that our impact is global um, and how much we've grown in the last few years, um, I wanted to show you this slide. So the red dots are Triple GI members, so people that are participants in the platform. The yellow suns are where we have projects that are either led by the Triple GI as a combined effort or where our participants have individual projects because all of our members also do their individual work as well. The green flags are where we have secured government support for the initiative. So at the moment we have 12 governments. And the, the blue boxes are where we had participants take part in the consultation on the best practice framework, which I'll cover a little bit later. So even though there's still definitely some gaps in our map and areas where we'd like to work a little bit more going forward, I think in the, the three years that we've been operating, we've done quite well in making sure that we cover hotspot areas and, and our um, initiative globally. Next slide, please. So just to show again some of the organizations that are part of the initiative, uh, we've got at the moment 72 unique organizations and counting, especially since the sixth uh, Marine International Marine Debris Conference, we've had kind of an influx of organizations. So we see the teller going up every day, which is really exciting. Um, we have got 12 governments that have declared support for the initiative, and we also have some high, high, high level affiliates working with us. So Un United Nations Environment Programme, FAO, NOAA, of course, uh, the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organisation, which is the Australian Government Research Organisation, the European Commission and the International Whaling Commission. And you can see there on the slide, um, there's some high level NGOs that are part of the initiative, such as Ocean Conservancy, um, some big seafood players like Trimarine, but also other organizations like Dive Group Paddy, for example, that are part of, part of the platform. Next slide, please. Um, so just to give you a bit of a flavor of what our recent highlights are. So this, this photo was taken uh, two years ago in Miami where we had our annual meeting. So once a year as an initiative, we come together to meet face to face and our steering group has an interim meeting as well. And you can see everyone's smiling. So it must, must mean that everyone's happy with the progress we're making. Um, and year on year, we've seen that picture grow of people taking part in the initiative, which is fabulous. Um, next slide, please. So just to focus on a few of the highlights of last year and early this year um, of the initiative. Um, so within the Build Evidence Working Group, we've been working on the construction of a data portal and companion app for the, um, for the uh, reporting and tracking of lost gear. Um, and if we could quickly flick to the next slide. Um, this is the interface of the app that we've created. Um, so when we first started the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, we really felt that in order to formulate solutions or best practice, we needed to have a good understanding of the problem. And it became very clear straight away that the information out there on Ghost Gear was very patchy um, and that there wasn't a uniform system for recording that information either. So we combined two things. We launched an app, which you can see the interface here now, which we launched at 6 a.m. this year, which is live now on all 
um, Apple and uh, Android Play stores, where you can record Ghost Gear as an individual member and also as an industry member, people can record it there. It's very user friendly. And the information that you log into that app will go straight onto our data portal, um, which is a global data hub where we have more than 300,000 records at the moment brought together on Ghost Gear. Um, I've heard it's, it's one of the biggest, um, the biggest collections of data on Ghost Gear are currently out there. Um, and that those two tools really bring the information together that we currently have and we can help, for example, governments or industry partners with formulating baselines. We can hopefully over time see the progress that we make around our solution projects and contribute as well uh, to the scientific community. Could we go back to the previous slide, please? So, um, so that's definitely been a highlight for us in terms of building evidence. The second working group has been focusing on formulating best practice. And we uh, developed a framework for the best practice management for fishing gear, which went through an industry consultation of more than 50 industry stakeholders. And Joel will cover this off in a bit more detail. But the, the key uh, takeaway point from this working group was really that we wanted to offer um, our stakeholders something tangible that they could do. Um, and that, that document provided that for us, but we didn't want to create it in isolation. So it went through a rigorous uh, feedback system to make sure that the guidance document was practical, was useful, and also that um, industry players and other stakeholders would come on board with it and actually start implementing afterwards. We also launched eight new solution projects in the last year, and we are planning to have 12, um, 12 uh, to be completed this year in 2018. Um, and that's why I'm Vanuatu, because we have a project here um, that's, that's performing really well, which Joan will cover in her presentation. And all of our projects, as I mentioned, they work across the four hours where possible, but they also go through a rigorous training process um, through our project review board, uh, which is made up of experts who comment and review the projects before they're given the green light for go ahead to make sure that we don't um, have little projects working in isolation, but more global projects. And we have a set of criteria that each project will be scored against before it goes to the steer steering group for final approval. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, so we've also really worked on raising the profile of our initiative um, to get the word out there on Ghost Gear. Um, as I was saying when we were chatting a little bit before this webinar started, I really feel that Ghost Gear is kind of the next big thing in the marine debris community. And there's more and more attention for it and more and more awareness um, of the issue, which is really great. Um, and we've definitely tried to help raise that profile. So we've been part of um, some of the big seafood industry events. So for example, the SeaWeb Summit, um, Boston Seafood Expo, Brussels Seafood Expo, where we always try and have a speaking slot or a panel um, and engage companies on the issue. Um, and over the last year, we've been active in those fora and which is resulting now in us being invited um, through our experts in the initiative on panels, et cetera. Um, and so at CWEB this year, we'll, we'll have one of those panels. Um, we've also really been engaging in a policy sphere um, and we've been working with the United Nations and their different bodies. So for example, UNFAO, UN, UNEP, um, to build a profile on the issue and share our expertise. Um, one, of those, uh, one of those platforms that we've been working with um, is the United Nations Food and Agriculture Guidelines for the Marking of Fishing Gear, which went through a consultation uh, over the last few years um, and have now been approved by technical consultation earlier this year. And what that means is that there'll be a set of voluntary guidelines around the marking and tracking of fishing gear, which um, has benefits in terms of lost gear, retrieval of gear, tracking of gear, but also to combat issues such as IEU fishing. And so we've been helping shaping those guidelines uh, we've been also forming partnerships with other platforms like the EU Commission, um, where we've shared data with them to help formulate their baselines, et cetera, um, and, and, and been working with them to help potentially uh, implement some projects that can help with the monitoring of those baselines as well. Um, and obviously, there's always been some government engagement as well with individual governments, but also with platforms such as the Commonwealth uh, Summit, of which Canada um, oh, sorry, Canada and other countries like um, where came together in London a bit earlier this month uh, to discuss issues such as marine plastics and ghost gear. Next slide, please. 
Um, so this is kind of a continuation of the previous slide. So we've been working on things like the Sustainable Fisheries Resolution um, and events around World Ocean Day to make sure that GOSGI was recognised in, in those policy platforms as well and those guidelines so that it really gives countries a tool as well to advocate at national level why marine action plans um, should include GOSGI and why action at that level is important. Uh, the Sustainable Fisheries Resolution, for example, recognises that GOSGI he has a strong economic impact um, as well as an environmental impact which gives um, industry players also a tool to take action uh, and obviously the highlight last year was the UN Ocean Conference first ever conference where countries at the United Nations level came together in that capacity to discuss our oceans health including the issue of marine litter and ghost gear um, and that was the culminating event where we saw 12 governments come on board with the global ghost gear initiative next slide please I'm just conscious of time, so I'll quickly go over two solution projects um, that we've been delivering to the Global Ghost Care Initiative, um, but then Joan will cover one of our projects in a bit of greater detail. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, so one of the projects that we've been working on is gear marking project in Indonesia and more specifically the, the marking of gill nets, which you can see there in the top photo um, that I used for lobster fishing. Um, and the project, the importance of the project is really to provide practical evidence to include, to, um, to underpin some of those policy processes. So when the FAO um, wanted to produce guidelines or the, more specifically the FAO member states, we wanted to make sure that the guidelines were informed by practical evidence, especially from developing countries. So we worked with them on developing this project around the tagging and marking of fishing gear, trialing different tagging and uh, tracking methods and getting feedback from the fishermen to then be included in that technical process, which has been uh, really helpful and well received. Next slide, please. Another project that we've been working on is the Alaska project on end of life fishing gear and providing a circular economy model for those end of life nets. Um, and the success of this project is really um, that it shows how valuable fishing nets can be as a commodity. Um, and also this project um, has been scaled up. So this year we'll be looking at four additional sites and some of the learnings of this project have also informed recycling projects in, for example, countries like Denmark and South Africa. So um, this project is kind of the perfect embodiment of the Triple GI spirit where we focus on sustainable projects, but also projects that are replicable um, across, um, across the entire world. Um, and we're all about sharing information and sharing lessons learned. Next slide, please. So I'll hand over to my colleague, Joel now, who's the Secretariat of the Global Ghost Care Initiative, who will talk a little bit more about how we've engaged the seafood industry um, in terms of best practice. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, hello, everyone, and, and thanks very much for the opportunity to present on this webinar. We, we really do appreciate it. Um, so I'll just, as Ingrid mentioned, go into a little bit of um, how we've engaged the seafood industry and um, go into a little bit more detail about the best practice framework for the management of fishing gear document that uh, Ingrid had mentioned earlier on. So the best practice framework, what exactly is it? Well, um, it's, a, it's a rather large document that was developed by the Triple GI um, that was designed to, it was aimed at all the areas of the fishing supply chain from gear manufacturers to regulating authorities, seafood companies, fishers themselves. Um, the idea was to um, engage and collaborate with the industry to create a document that addresses ghost gear throughout that seafood supply chain in a holistic and a realistic way. So we're talking about um, identifying where the main uh, causes of gear are throughout that chain, where are the, uh, the best ways that we can prevent it, and um, also identifying the worst types of gear with, with uh, respect to both uh, frequency of loss and impact if it is lost, and trying to find ways that we can um, come up with a cohesive set of recommendations throughout the fishing industry um, at those various levels um, to figure out how to best address it um, in a holistic way. Um, so the purpose was to develop that document and then um, pass it or, or to make it available rather to stakeholders across the uh, um, across the supply chain um, as a sort of voluntary way for them to uh, mitigate the effects of ghost gear. 
Um, it was also aimed at others are involved in responsible seafood production and supply. So we're talking researchers, governments, seafood businesses, NGOs, anybody who has some, uh, something to contribute uh, to this discussion. Uh, it draws together knowledge and experience um, from all of these different organizations and, and individuals uh, that took part in a uh, very extensive consultation to prepare the document. Uh, and it's designed to um, well, engage and enthuse stakeholders in this, in this issue um, and also to educate as well. So it covers a variety of different types of fishing gear, uh, including fads or fish aggregating devices for those who may not be familiar with the term. Um, uh, it does not include aquaculture related equipment just yet, but that is something that we're looking at incorporating as well. So when we were defining the scope of the best practice framework, what exactly should it look like? Um, one of the first things that was looked at was uh, fishing gear type and, and where it, what are the most common types of gear? Um, where are they most predominantly used? Um, and then we also looked at the likelihood that they would be lost just through regular fishing activities and the impact if they were lost. And then we came up with a scale um, to sort of rate what was the most uh, harmful form of, of ghost gear. You can see a couple of charts there that fill some of that information in. Um, and you can see the red there, gill nets were found to be by far the most um, damaging form of, um, of ghost gear. If it does get lost, first of all, it's very likely that it can get lost. It's a very thin mesh. It snags very easily. Uh, it tears easily as well on things, rocks and things like that underneath the surface. And if it does get lost, it also has a nasty habit of floating in the water column, um, even if it is snagged on something, which means that it will continue to catch and kill um, fish and marine animals for quite some time after it's, uh, after it's been lost. Um, Traps and pots were identified as a close second and uh, fish aggregating devices or fads, as we mentioned, were third and just sort of goes down the line from there. That isn't to say that other forms of ghost gear are not, um, you know, do not need to be addressed. They absolutely all do. Uh, but this gives an idea of the main um, focus or the, or the worst types of gear loss um, for, for when this gear actually is lost. But again, all gear does need to be managed. So, the best practice framework was created as a way to, again, make sure that we had some recommendations and some practical, realistic recommendations um, for how different parts of the seafood supply chain could address this type of a thing. Um, so uh, one of our Triple GI participants, Ocean Outcomes, or O2, was hired to run an external consultation with various um, uh, industry stakeholders. Um, there was a lot of positive participation throughout all layers of that supply chain that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and there was a lot of discussions for development of pilot and solution projects incorporating, incorporating rather the best practice framework. Uh, fisheries improvement projects or FIPS uh, are a good example of that. But of course, we do try to incorporate um, the relevant parts of the best practice framework document in our own solutions work. Um, so the consultation methodology, uh, Feedback was solicited via two methods. First of all, webinars, and second of all, an online survey for those who were unable to participate in the webinars. So we held 13 uh, webinars between April and September of 2017, 38 unique participants from across those sectors, and we had 64 unique respondents to the survey. Um, again, industry offering feedback and assessing the best practice framework strengths and weaknesses to make sure that the recommendations that were contained therein uh, were actually practical, were actually doable, uh, and made sense. Uh, so the full best practice framework document um, is available now. It's um, available to anyone who's interested via the Triple GI website at www.ghostgear.org. Um, and if anybody, of course, um, has any questions or anything like that, uh, there will be questions at the end of the webinar, but also you can feel free to get in touch with me as well. And I'll do my best to, uh, to answer your questions. So that's a brief overview of the best practice framework document. I, I really suggest that you take a look and download uh, and to, or sorry, download and take a look at it. Um, it's a really uh, extensive document, but um, it's, it's one that really does try to address the problem holistically, which is what the triple GI is all about. So there was a global response. Um, we had every continent represented, which was, which was huge. Um, all of the seafood supply chain uh, sectors that I mentioned were uh, represented except for port operators. 67% um, of the respondents labeled ghost gear as moderate or highly significant to their specific operation, uh, which was already high uptake. Um, I'm sure that that number is only going to increase now with, um, with uh, ghost gear being the sort of the next big thing in marine debris as uh, Ingrid related. And uh, as definitely as a, a 
an upcoming marine sustainability issue, at least in terms of uh, knowledge of it. 83% of the respondents said it would be somewhat, or they would be likely uh, to influence their business practices. So the, um, the initial uptake, um, or at least the um, uh, people saying that they would um, incorporate the, the recommendations contained within was uh, quite high. And uh, respondents indicated primarily that the regulatory approaches would be best suited to mitigating the effects of ghost gear. But again, there are, uh, there are several different layers to that. And I encourage you again to download that document if you have any questions about it. So when it comes to corporate engagement, uh, we have had some corporates joining the Triple GI. Um, one of our largest um, corporates that's joined um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Thai Union Group. Um, they joined at the Seafood Expo North America in Boston last month. It was uh, hugely exciting for us. Um, we do have some fishing industry representation already on board with Triple GI, but it's great to have Thai Union jumping on board as well. Um, that shows that we've come quite a long way over the last few years uh, since we launched at the end of 2015. Uh, it really has become a major, uh, a major issue of concern for other uh, for corporates and for the industry itself. Um, so Waitrose and Morrison's out of the UK, some supermarkets are getting involved because obviously uh, they have their supply chains that have um, uh, fishing industry as part of them. Uh, so it's about, again, trying to address this issue holistically. Um, and I think it's also very important to point out that the fishing industry is not the villain in this story. Um, you know, we've, we've all seen lots of photographs of what the gear looks like and when it catches things, but it's crucial to keep in mind uh, that the fishing industry is not the villain and we need to understand the primary reasons for gear loss. So in the developed world, it's very rare for fishers to intentionally lose gear. It's expensive. It's also the means by which they feed two to three billion people. Um, in developing or artisanal fisheries, it's more common for gear to be intentionally discarded, but Mostly this is due to a lack of proper disposal alternatives um, and a lack of education. Uh, this is why Triple GI projects are not just about the removal of lost gear, uh, but also the prevention of gear loss. Finding circular economic solutions for, uh, for end-of-life gear so it doesn't end up in the water uh, and educating fishers in the fishing industry on the global impacts of lost gear. So um, there's also, of course, the illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing, or IUU, which is a major contributor to ghost gear as well. Um, so illegal vessels may dump gear in order to avoid detection by authorities or to be, uh, avoid be being denied entry into port. But the main point to keep in mind is that it's essential to work positively and collaboratively with the industry to have a lasting effect. And that's kind of what the Triple GI is all about. So we welcome uh, these high-level corporates that are seeing the, um, seeing the effects of ghost gear, seeing how it affects the supply chain and global food security and uh, jumping on board. Um, yeah, and I think I will leave it there. And again, conscious of time, I will pass it on to Joan to uh, do a, an overview of a couple of solutions projects we have on the go. All right, well, thanks a lot. Um, I'm Joan Drinkwin and uh, like Joel and Ingrid, I'm very happy to be here. Thanks so much for hosting us. I'm gonna talk more uh, focus now on a solution project that's happening in the South Pacific. So, next slide. Uh oh, what happened? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Joan. Yeah, I've, I've moved the okay, slide. Okay, I'm sorry. I think I lost you. Hold on. Thank you. Um, this is a, a great diagram developed by the South Pacific community. It shows a variety of different kinds of fishing that use fish aggregation devices. This is a very common kind of fishing gear that's used in the tuna fishing world. Uh, it's used in all different oceans and this is, this is particularly um, a diagram of how they're used in the South Pacific Ocean. So industrial fishing uh, companies like Thai Union and like Trimarine will use um, drifting fish aggregation devices that are deployed in the, um, in, in the high seas. And then they aggregate um, tuna around them and then the purse seiners will come and set their nets. The fish aggregation devices that are used like this are generally tagged with satellite buoys that transmit their position um, to the fishing companies and to the captains of the vessels. They also have eco sounders, which will show how much fish is aggregating underneath 
the fish aggregation devices. So these satellite buoys are incredibly valuable and have really contributed to the efficiency of tuna fishing. They allow fishermen to target, um, target fish aggregation devices that have fish, known fish aggregations, and that helps them reduce fuel costs and fishing time as well. In the artisanal, in the artisanal fishery, oftentimes they uh, use fish aggregation devices that are anchored. So you'll see examples of those. And this is the, um, the kind of fish aggregation device that we're working with in Vanuatu. So these are important tools for industrial tuna fishing and artisanal fishing in the South Pacific. They have many benefits. They um, consolidate the target species and reduce fuel costs and fishing time, but they do have negative impacts as well. And that's why the Global Ghost Gear Initiative has ranked them third in terms of the kinds of gear that needs to be addressed in the best practice framework. In terms of ghost fishing, drifting fads and anchored fads that become separated from their mooring, moorings can drift into sensitive nearshore areas and damage coral reefs, seagrasses, and mangroves. And depending on their design, they can also entangle non-target species with sea turtles and sharks being particularly vulnerable. Next slide. So the fish aggregation devices that are generally used in Vanuatu, it's a unique design called the Vatuika design, and it's an anchored fish aggregation design. Um, this is a low cost uh, design, and it's, it's actually one of the designs that's less entangling. So if you look at this diagram, you'll see that it doesn't have a lot of mesh in the subsurface appendage, and it doesn't have a raft. So this is a relatively non-entangling design. So one thing I did want to mention is that the work that we're doing on this project is very specific to the South Pacific, but it will have lessons that can be applied in other geographic regions and can be applied globally. The use of anchored fish aggregation devices in artisanal fisheries is spreading um, rapidly on, in a global level. So next slide. This is what that fish aggregation device looks like on the top of the water. So you can see that it's pretty difficult to see, but um, this is the kind of thing that a fisherman will motor out to and fish around. And they're generally placed from one to seven nautical miles offshore. Next slide. The project in the South Pacific that I'm working on with the Global Ghost Gear Initiative has two parts. The first part is working with an industrial fishing company, Trimarine, and we're assessing their fad management practices against the FAO's draft guidelines on the marking of fishing gear. Ingrid mentioned this as a very important sort of milestone event in the work of the Global Ghost Gear Initiative around um, marking and tracking fishing gear. So that technical consultation of the marking of fishing gear happened in February in Rome. So what we were doing was looking at all the different procedures and policies that Trimarine has adopted against the draft guidelines for marking of fishing gear and making an assessment and providing a report to that technical consultation. The second part of that work that we're, that we're doing with Trimarine is we're actually looking at some of the fads, the, the satellite buoys that they're no longer tracking. Industrial fishing companies will track their fads until they leave their fishing areas or until they leave productive fishing grounds. And so in generally drifting fads are, are the satellite buoys on those drifting fads are deactivated by the industrial fishers. So what we asked Trimarine is if we could continue to track those fads after they're done tracking them. And that's part of this project. The second part of the South, the Fad Tracking South Pacific project is working with the Vanuatu Fisheries Department to try a low cost tracking mechanisms on their anchored fads. Next slide. The project in Vanuatu is um, again going to, we use that project to provide some recommendations to the FAO technical guidelines for the marking of fishing gear, but those recommendations were from the perspective of an artisanal fisheries and a, and a developing country fisheries management. 
Next slide. In Vanuatu, what we're doing is we're looking at their anchored FAD program and we're trying to find a low cost position tracking device that can be used by the Vanuatu Fisheries Department to keep track of their anchored fish aggregation devices. Even though they're anchored, they do often get lost. Um, this happens because of weather, sometimes um, boats run over the lines, sometimes there's vandalism. So very frequently, in fact, their anchored fish aggregation devices are lost, which is not unique to Vanuatu. It happens globally. So what we've done is we're, we've chosen to use the systems device. This is the, the, the designed as a fisheries management monitoring tool. It works over the cellular network rather than the satellite network. And because of that, it's much cheaper. In addition to the data systems, We're testing. We're also going to be using. Hey, Joan, Joan, hang on just a sec. Uh, we're not able to hear you. I don't know if you can hear us. Joan, can you hear us? And okay, I think we might have lost Joan. Yeah. Joan, can you hear us now? Joan, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Uh, you're breaking up really bad. You might want to jump off the webinar and pop back on. Uh, we can't really understand anything you're saying right now. Um, I can, uh, there we go, sorry. Sorry for the technical difficulties, everyone. Uh, hopefully, Joan will be able to pop back in the webinar in a second. In the meantime, uh, if anybody has questions already for our panelists, feel free to submit them by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your webinar screen. Uh, type in your questions and we'll be drawing from them through the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Uh, Joan, you're muted right now. I'm trying to unmute you, but it doesn't seem to be working. Hello, can you hear me now? No, it's coming in all broken up again. Um, let me see. You might be able to... Ingrid has suggested in the chat that we could jump to questions. Um, alternatively, if, if she or Joel would like to wrap up Joan's um, presentation, uh, we could also do that. So I guess we can wait a couple more seconds here to see if Joan comes back. Ingrid is bringing up uh, the presentation. Okay, perfect. Oh, John's back. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Excellent. No, you're fine. I, <laughs> um, I'll just run through the rest of the slides really quickly. Um, I started talking about the satellite buoy that we were using on the anchored fads in Vanuatu. And the reason we're using those is to provide some quality control for the pelagic data systems device. And we're also, because we know the satellite buoys will work, but they're extremely expensive. They're about 10 times more expensive than the Pelagic data system. So we're trying to find a lower cost device that will just track position. The satellite buoys do more than just track position, which is, they do more than we need them to do. They also have an eco sounder, which actually is 
is something that the Vanuatu Fisheries Department is very interested in. So we're providing that to them in this project as well. Next slide. So this is a picture of some of the uh, crew that would put the pelagic data system device on the anchored fad. You'll see it attached to that pole. And, um, and the buoys have been marked with the fad number. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, next slide. That's just the crew that did it. Next slide. <laughs> it's a good picture though. Um, and here's their location. And basically what we're doing when we're looking at the interface with the sat link buoy is we're making sure that the buoy is staying within this circle. Um, you can imagine how it works with an anchored fad is it's like the, the fad is on a tether, which is anchored to the bottom of the ocean. And so when you see the position tracking, it generally is going around in a circle. So next slide. And again, here's the pelagic data system interface, which basically shows the circle also. So we're, we're checking this on a daily basis. And if we see that the, um, the position goes off that circle, then we know it's been lost. And we have an agreement with Ocean Blue Fishing in Vanuatu, which uh, one of the guys was shown in that picture, that they will actually go to retrieve the fad. Next slide. Next slide. So some of the challenges are is that we want to make sure that before we use any of these devices that we actually have an agreement with somebody on the ground who will retrieve the fads and the devices if they go missing. So that's one of the critical pieces of this project is to have this agreement with Ocean Blue Fishing. Next slide. So all of Vanuatu Fisheries Department has been trained in the interfaces with the satellite buoy and the pelagic data systems and um, and they're they're monitoring those next slide so we're still you know obviously always thinking about phase two and because we're looking at innovative technologies there's always new things that are coming online so we're in conversation with a number of different com companies that are developing Next slide. Thank you. So I think I'm, am I turning this over to Ingrid? Sure. Um, so, um, so thank you so much, Joan and Joel, for covering this. So what we're trying to do with the Global Ghost Gear Initiative as a whole now is really build not only on the number of participants that we've got, um, but also on the number of projects that we employ and the number of um, outputs that we have. Um, so we've had really great success over the last few years, and every year we come together to showcase our annual, at our annual meeting what we've achieved um, in that year. And this year we'll be coming together in Indonesia, so in, in Bali, um, ahead of the Our Ocean Conference. So if, if anyone's interested in joining the initiative and attending the annual meeting, please get in touch with Joel. Um, and he can ensure that you receive all the, the latest information. So now what we really want to do is grow the initiative, both in the expertise that we have um, that we have currently. So if anyone on the line is interested in joining or providing some expertise or wants to learn more, please get in touch with us. Because the idea is that the initiative really becomes a self-sustained platform um, into the future to to continue doing the great project work that Joel, uh, Joan just highlighted that we're doing here in Vanuatu to get industry players on board and to change the world when it comes to ghost gear. So I think we've now come to the Q&A part of the session. Great, thank you very much, Ingrid, Joel, and Joan. Again, I'm John Davis, supervisor of marinedebris.info. We now open up the webinar uh, to audience Q&A for the next 13 minutes or so. If audience members, again, have a question for our presenters, you can submit it in the, uh, or by clicking on the Q&A button on the webinar user interface menu at the bottom of your webinar screen, and we'll be drawing from them uh, in the next several minutes. So first one, uh, talks about corporate social responsibility. Uh, if Trimarine have no interest in tracking the fads anymore and they're no longer using them, uh, should they be required to remove the fad that they're no longer interested in to prevent any, obviously, unnecessary entanglement or damage to marine life? 
Joan, do you want to take that yeah, question? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I mean, that that's that is the million dollar question. <laughs> so you, you hit the nail on the head. Obviously, this is a fishing um, technique that has gear abandonment sort of built into it. And this is something that we're, you know, having conversation. There's a lot of different organizations that are even more involved in the fat issue than we are and have been asking that question a lot. And one of the things that Trimarine is really interested in doing is trying to figure out a way, if not to retrieve the fads that they're no longer tracking, but to somehow mitigate for um, any of that beaching or to um, develop relationships perhaps with some of the artisanal fishers in the areas where their fads end up. Um, so they're, they're definitely looking at that and trying to figure out a way because it is a concern for them. The other thing that they're doing in particular is they're doing some pilot work with biodegradable fads. And the idea there is to try to develop a fad that, is, that will biodegrade before it beaches in near shore environments. So they're looking at a six month to, to 12 month lifespan as the ideal lifespan for these biodegradable fads. So that's another um, track that they're working on. Thanks, Joan. That's actually a, a great lead into the next question, which talks about biodegradable fishing gear in general. Are you also looking at replacing other types of gear, not just fads, with different biodegradable materials? And could industry be convinced to switch them, even if it meant having to uh, replace their gear perhaps more often than they otherwise do? Joel, do you want to take that question? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the primary thing for the uh, for the industry is that um, it would need to be um, probably as efficient uh, or or very close to um, current methods. Um, but biodegradable uh, fishing gear and and not just even biodegradable, but just new methods of fishing gear, um, new methodology, new technology. That's something we're very much interested in in the Triple GI um, and some of our uh, participants. Uh, Joan mentioned pelagic data systems who've created that sort of vessel slash gear tracker device to try to figure out um, what happens to these things when they're lost, so we can gather some more data on it. Um, that's all. Some those are all things we're very interested in. I think there's also a you know a bit of um, there's a bit of uh, a question about whether or not biodegradable stuff is necessarily the right way to go, um, only because if biodegradable stuff breaks down and we're still talking about using the biodegradable plastic, um, are we just having microplastics, you know, is it just breaking down in a microplastic that much sooner? And is that um, a solution? Um, so, you know, are we talking about then using compostable materials or things like cotton rope? Um, they're all things that uh, are out there, um, but we're definitely interested in having those conversations and also, um, you know, pushing those types of things out through our industry contacts and our industry participants as well uh, to have that conversation. So it's a really good question. And it's something that I think we're definitely interested in. That's great. Thanks, Joel. Uh, we have a couple questions from Kelvin Passfield in the Cook Islands. Uh, one is uh, with regard to uh, the abandoned drifting fads that are always washing up in the Cooks, uh, they often have loose netting attached, which can easily entangle marine life. Is that something that you're working on as well, that loose netting? And then he, he mentions that the, uh, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing this, Te Apukarea Society in the Cooks is an NGO very, very interested in ghost fishing gear. And would you be interested in having them join you? Well, I can, I can address the first one. Um, the first question, and uh, we'd be really interested in understanding um, that problem. So, Kelvin, if you can get my contact information, and maybe we can communicate after this this webinar, because what we're trying to do is find areas where there are sort of hot spots of fads that are washing up in near shore areas. And so if that's happening a lot in the Cook Islands, that might be a really great place for us to start to try to develop a retrieval program. The netting that you're talking about is generally used in the subsurface appendage for the fads. And it's definitely one of the problems with the fads. And that's, that's that netting can you know, entangled animals and also it can damage near shore habitats. So it is definitely something that we're very interested in. And I'd like to, you know, communicate more with you about that particular area. And I'm sure we would be happy to have you um, join the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, but I'll let Ingrid handle that question. Um, 
I think the answer to that question is yes, we would like <laughs> for as many uh, organizations to join the initiative. And I think um, just from being here in Vanuatu uh, th this week, it seems like it's a similar problem in, for example, the Solomon Islands, um, where they see a lot of fats beaching with the nets still hanging off it um, and those nets put, uh, prov being a hazard um, just for g getting caught in the propellers of fishing boats. So not only for marine habitats, fish and marine animals, but also just from a human safety point of view. And they actually had an accident a few weeks ago where a boat with school children got tangled in one of the uh, ghost nets that was drifting around and capsized. So um, mm -hmm. definitely an issue that is very relevant here in the Pacific. Um, and yeah, if we could collaborate in the Cook Islands, that would be fabulous. What's the best way for interested people to contact the Triple GI to get involved? Um, best to get in touch with Joel, who's our secretariat, um, and he's across the whole initiative and then can introduce um, people to other relevant people within the initiative. Okay. Um, so I can type the email, his email address in the, in the chat box. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Ingrid. So Joel's email will be in the chat box on screen, everybody. Um, there's a question. Do you have information about any country that has legislation uh, to control uh, ghost fishing gear or the loss of fishing gear by industry or artisanal fisheries? Um, I'm, I'm happy to take that question. So um, there's a number of international policy instruments that that talk about ghost fishing. And for example, one of the ones um, that we've been working on is MARPOL Index 5, which is uh, a, a legislative tool um, that is actually enforceable, um, implemented by the International Maritime Organization that talks about the, um, the dumping, the losing, or the discarding of fishing gear. Um, and, and is um, all countries that are binded to the IMO um, have to implement that. However, even though there is there are certain instruments like the Marple Index 5 or things like UN Environment Programme um, rules and legislation in place, um, it very comes down to the national level. Um, and often we found within the Global Ghost Gear Initiative that carrot works better than stick. So even though it's impo important to have that ingrained in policy and legislation um, and to have some sort of penalty system attached to it, we find that if you can show people the benefit of why um, of, of why it's important to mark gear, track gear, etc., uh, you'll actually get better results. I think the other important thing to note is that in general, um, fishing fishermen fishing in the street don't want to lose fishing gear. Um, fishing gear is expensive, it's valuable. So often um, it, it can be lost or abandoned just because it gets snagged or bad weather conditions, gear conflict, etc. cetera. Um, obviously there's the issue of illegal and unreported fishing where there's a lot of uh, gear being abandoned at sea. But even then, um, fishing gear is expensive and valuable. So people don't generally want to lose it on purpose. Um, and so certain um, national legislation countries um, cover this in their in their um, legislation. For example, Australia, where I'm generally based, is one of them. Um, some of the European countries that are um, fallen the European Commission and the European in Council are, 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 are some of the other countries. Um, there's some definitely some pioneering countries, like for example in Norway, uh, where there's an incentive scheme from the government where uh, fishermen can bring back gear that they pick up um, in the ocean back to shore and there's a certain incentive scheme around that. Um, but in other countries there's still some work to be done around it. So it depends kind of on the individual country where the legislation is at and also where the adoption of the various um, international policy instruments is at as well. Um, but what we try and do through the Global Ghost Gear Initiative is to, um, to promote some of the benefits of taking action on ghost gear, retrieval of gear or prevention of losing gear in the first place. That's great. Thanks, Ingrid. And everybody, uh, anyone who's interested in um, getting involved with the Triple GI, uh, Joel Basic's email address is now in the chat box. Um, I have a couple questions on getting up to speed uh, on, on the topic of ghost fishing. Um, you said, I think um, both Ingrid and Joel, you said that you anticipate the ghost gear will be the next big thing in terms of public awareness with regard to marine debris. Uh, are there ways that the Global Ghost Gear Initiative is, is actively trying to ensure that it becomes the next big thing in terms of publicity? 
And um, when people get engaged on this issue who are new to it, uh, can you recommend places for them to go to learn more in general about ghost fishing once they're engaged? Joel, did you want to take that question? Yeah, sure. I mean, as, as far as it uh, goes, or as far as um, going, where do you go to get more information? I think right now that the, the Triple GI or the, the Global Ghost Gear Initiative website is probably the best place to go um, at the moment. But we do have a lot of infographics and we've developed a lot of uh, these types of outreach documents to try to um, educate people who are interested about the issue. Um, follow us on Twitter is another good way to uh, see what the, um, the various um, participants that we have are, are doing and, and keep up to date on these types of things. We also have our own webinars that we um, that we have every quarter. Um, there's a Triple GI newsletter as well. That's a great way to uh, keep up to date on what's going on, not only with the Triple GI uh, as, a, as its own movement, but also what some of our participants are doing in the Ghost Gear space as well on their own. Um, and anybody who's interested in that, feel free to email me and uh, it just goes out through MailChimp um, once a month or so, or if there's uh, potentially more frequently, if there's some other bit of information we want to, uh, uh, we want to get out there. But um, those are the primary um, ways that we're looking to disseminate that information. But of course, we're also, um, as you mentioned, we're, we've been going to a lot of conferences, a lot of events, whether it was 6IMDC or Seafood Expo North America. Um, uh, our ocean conference, UN ocean conference, we, we've um, been having a, uh, a lot more um, participation in a lot of these, uh, these types of events. So if you're there, um, chances are somebody will be there from the Global Ghost Gear Initiative at, at, at least most of the major ones. But in the meantime, feel free to get in contact with me and I can sign you up to the newsletter and provide whatever information you like. Excellent. Thanks, Joel. Uh, we're, we're nearly out of time on the webinar. We have uh, time for, I think, one more question. And it has to do with IUU fishing. And I, I don't know how many, uh, how often uh, you end up facing IUU fishing questions, but um, uh, this one has to do with particularly illegal fishing. Will it require more in terms of conservation education to actually reduce the illegal fishing? And how do you think this will work due to the typically high market value of species that are targeted illegally? Coming from the ghost gear side of things, do you have an answer to that, to that question? Um, I, I could try and give an answer <laughs> to the best of my ability. Um, so IU fishing is definitely one of those hot topic issues um, at the moment and one that a lot of seafood companies and governments want to take action on. Um, we've recently done a lot of work on uh, connecting the issue um, of ghost gear with IU fishing and highlighting um, how they are connected. So for example, with IU fishing, they often operate at night. They often um, access, uh, denied access entry to ports. They don't have, um, they don't have access to port reception facilities for gear, etc. And in those ways, they're very strongly connected. Um, I can copy a link in the chat box to an information gallery that we've just created with five short videos connecting IUU and ghost gear as well as a number of information slides and uh, a few papers as well uh, that people can visit there. In terms of tackling the problem of ghost gear and IUU, there's a number of instruments like, for example, the marking of fishing gear um, that are being put in place to help with this issue. Um, and a lot of governments, like, for example, the Indonesian government, are definitely uh, putting pressure on to crack down on these practices. Um, and we see that it has actually been having a positive effect. Um, in Australia, we saw um, in 2004, a lot of ghost nets washing up from Indonesian shores on Australian, in Australian waters, mainly from illegal activities. And in recent years, especially since the new government have come in place and cracked down on illegal fishing, we can see there's been a reduction in ghost nets washing up. So we see a strong correlation and also the action on IUU can have a positive, um, a positive effect on ghost gear as well. That's great. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, well, I think that that does it. We're out of time. Uh, and so we'll, we'll conclude this webinar. But I want to thank Ingrid Giskus, Joel Basic, and Joan Drinkwin for contributing your insights and, and for doing what you do with the Global Ghost Gear Initiative. I, uh, my hat is off to you. It's, it's an incredibly important um, uh, job that you're doing. And I applaud you for it. Thank Thanks you so much. Um, and 
And thank you to the audience for participating as well. Uh, great questions. And I hope that it was useful to you. So uh, to everyone, have a, have a good day. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, take care.